Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of, you guessed it, the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner. I'm the producer of the show. We're certainly happy to have you here with us today. We've got a really, really interesting guest, Barry Tesler Linden. She's a financial therapist, mentor coach. She calls herself a mamapreneur, and she's the founder of The Art of Money. She's guided thousands of people to new, empowered, and refreshingly honest relationships with money through her nurturing and, get this, body-centered approach. Really, really cool. So every year, 500 plus students from around the globe go through her year-long Art of Money program, and her work has been featured on Oprah.com, uh, Inc.com, Huffington Post, U.S. News and World Report, Fiscal Times, USA Today, uh, Nerd Wallet, Simple Dollar, Red Book Magazine, on and on and on. Uh, she's the author of The Art of Money, A Life-Changing Guide to Financial Happiness. So really interesting guest today. Before I turn it over to Ian, I want to remind you about his new course, True You, which is about to drop, but you can go get on the wait list at typologyinstitute.com right now. And the unique thing about this is Ian covers instincts, subtypes, passion, basic fears and desires, uh, virtues, and then what I think we're all after, the, the path to transformation. I know uh, just even through the process of him building this course, I've turned a major corner in uh, my understanding of the Enneagram and its impact on me. So I hope you check that out. You can go get on the wait list at typologyinstitute.com. And without any further ado, here is the host of our show, Ian Crum. Hey, Barry, welcome to Typology. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. So I am fascinated by you already. Uh, you know, I get show notes from different people and I'm like, Wow, this is going to be really, really interesting. So uh, there's a couple of reasons why. We are both fours with three wings. Uh, we both work, we're both right. Uh, we are both in the co coaching consulting space, right? I do a lot of corporate consulting. Um, and we're both therapists. And uh, I have spent an incredible amount of time in Boulder, Colorado. I can tell you all of my favorite restaurants in, in Boulder. If I want to go for breakfast, like I have to go to Snooze. Mm -hmm. uh, f f I guess Frosca would be another one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think of where else. Uh, Oak would be another one. Uh -huh. You all have you all have like these single name restaurants there, you know. We do and, salt and salts, pasta, uh, corrida. Mateo, I can go on and on. Yeah. Right, corrida is another one. Um, my daughter went to the University of Colorado at Boulder, so I have spent a lot of time there. So we have a lot we could we could share in common. Okay, it's going to be fantastic. How did you first learn about the Enneagram? So I was in my 20s in graduate school to become a somatic psychotherapist at Naropa University. Yes. Colorado. And some point in my studies, I had a therapist that told me about the Enneagram. And she, I think, also told me what she thought my type was, which I don't think you should do. I think you really need to let the person come up with their own typing um, so that was, that was one of the first moments when I heard about it. And I think I went right to the wisdom of the Enneagram. Right. Me so in Hudson. Right. And what was your response when you found out you were a four with a three? A few responses. One was I wanted to go screaming, running <laughs> away <laughs> and, you know, never look back like, ah, then, you know, um, and it was pretty clear, you know, in your 20s, you're, you're really in your stuff. So I was really in family history and dynamics and trying to unravel all of that and, you know, doing my own work so that I could one day become a good therapist to hold space for others. It just, you know, so when I first saw it, it felt like the inside of me um, was turned inside out. And I could see myself, but I was also you know, wanted to go screaming, running away from it. 
And so while pretty quickly I knew that I was a four, um, I don't know if I knew about my wing at that time. And then there definitely was some confusion in my 30s as I became an entrepreneur, was growing my business, and you know, had so much energy and time and was, you know, growing my business around the clock. So everyone around me kept throwing at me, you're a three, you're a three, you're a three. And so there was some under, you know, deeper exploration there. But at some point I remember very clearly, you know, it's not like you know what you are and then you're okay with it and set with it. It was, I saw what I was, I was a four. And then there was this whole journey in my 30s where I, it maybe looked different for outsiders. I was getting a lot of different feedback. But when I really went deep over and over again, I came back to, no, I, I am indeed a four. I have a very strong three wing, uh, but I am indeed a four. Yeah. Operate, you know, everything is created from that place. Yeah. Uh, we're, again, very similar. I am a four with a very strong three wing although as i get older more and more that five uh seems to be abundantly present uh in my life um and as i've been telling people uh, in the last you know years that you know wings are not static you, you know what i mean like the the system is so fluid and dynamic that you know, we can make choices. Uh, you know, we can make conscious choices. Like, I got to write a book, man. So I, I got to really lean into those the resources and the energy and the traits of that five side of me. Uh, and or I'm, you know, in the middle of releasing a new course, and I've really got to I got to turn it on. So I've really got to lean on to my three side and draw from its resources and strengths, you know? So, you know, uh, I don't like to think of wings as something that are static and stuck, you know, but something that, as I oftentimes tell people, you never see a bird flying around with one wing. Uh, and so, you know, you're not gonna see one, any, anyone flying around with just one wing either, you know? True, and I can remember early on, I was in libraries a lot, and those card catalogs, Oh yeah. Very exciting for me. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, I have an inner librarian and yep. behind me is my husband's library of books. You, there's, it's a, it's a five library. Um, mine is upstairs, but so, yeah, I, and when I've had to write my book or when I create content, um, I, you know, I, I go way into the five and certainly as I, you know, I hit 50 last year, so I'm about to hit 52. Um, yeah, five, the five wing is coming up in a stronger way. Well, that's fantastic. Let's remind people just for a minute what a four with a three wing is like. Um, we uh, are very perfectionistic. Uh, we have a, probably more than any other type, a very strong one side. Uh, and um, we, when we see something that we envy, we tend to go after it. Right. Uh, versus a four with a five that it tends to be more introverted than a four with a three wing. We're more aggressive than a four with a five. So if we see something that we envy, it's like I'm actually going to go and get it right. Um, we are a little bit more image conscious than fours with fives, you know, uh, actually quite a bit more. Uh, as you know, uh, being married to a five, fives uh, are virtually have very little image consciousness unless they have a, a four wing. And my husband does. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so there's a little bit. Yeah. OK, so he picks out his uh, bike riding clothes a little bit more carefully than the, the average five with a six wing. Right. Um, we uh, express creativity uh, just for its own sake. Uh, but we like to be recognized. Uh, we like to be successful. We like to be recognized for being successful. Uh, and here's the downside of you and I is that um, we can be pretty elitist. Uh, and sometimes when we're not very self-aware, we can think of ourselves as being kind of superior to other people. <laughs> it's the side of that board with a three wing that's uh, our, our desire for specialness becomes a little inflated uh, compared to, I think, the, the four with a five, which is 
uh, a little quirkier, you know, uh, and earthy than the four with a with a three wing. So that's for our folks who are listening who are unfamiliar with that type combination or wing type combination. Um, I want to know what a financial therapist is. Uh, you are the uh, uh, author of The Art of Money, A Life-Changing Guide to Financial Happiness. I love this. I wish I had a business card with financial therapist on it, even though I'm not one, but because it sounds so dang cool. What is a, fi what is a financial therapist? So I love saying it too, because it stops people in their tracks. When people say, what do you do? I say, I'm a financial therapist. And they pause and they immediately say, oh, I need that. Or my brother needs that. Or my sister, or my mother, or my daughter, right? Um, so I created my version of a financial therapy method or methodology in 2001. And my husband, five, right? He came up with that word. He came mm. up with that title. He's come up with all the titles. Um, so when, um, you know, originally I trained as a somatic therapist, I thought my work would be around body and food and sexuality and sensuality and grief and death. Those are my topics. Such four topics. That is so <laughs> four. It's unbelievable. That sounds great. Like that's what I thought I'd be doing and working with couples. And when that school loan for me came due, it was just a huge epiphany moment of what is my relationship to money? Do I have one? Do I have a healthy one? Do I have a conscious one? Wait a second. When we were training to become therapists, did we have any money conversations, any teachings on how to work with couples around their dynamics, how to help them um, have better communication with each other, get on the same team? It just was so mind blowing to me that we did not. My gra entire graduate program got me through with no conversations or teachings around money. And so when that, you know, that, that student loan came due, it was an epiphany moment. I realized this is crazy. I'm either going to go, you know, again, screaming, running there, there we go again, you know, and just travel and never look back. I thought about it. You know, I like to present myself with options, but I knew pretty clearly I was going to take this topic on like I did every other big topic. And I started learning everything I could about money. And I started with bookkeeping first. Um, doing my own bookkeeping, then doing bookkeeping for other therapists and coaches and artists. And they had no idea I had a master's in psychology. They just threw their books at me. They wanted to have nothing. They did not want to have anything to do with it. And so I always say, this is the age of 28 when my student loan came due to 32. I learned more about people's relationship to money, their habit, habits, spending patterns, their values, what's important to them by doing their bookkeeping. I saw everything. Um, and at some point at the age of 32, it was time to integrate my past training as a psychotherapist with bookkeeping, the language of money, all these basic tools and systems and strategies that I was learning and falling in love with and really surprised the hell out of myself. I was reading QuickBooks manuals before bed. My husband, you know, knew me as a dancer, a therapist, a four, going, what, you know, what's happening to my wife? So in 2001, I had a mentor who said, it's time for you to give a talk on your methodology. And I said, what are you talking about? You know, and I like to work with one person or a couple, not groups of people. She said, young lady, it's, it's time for you. And so I went on a long walk in the woods and said, what am I supposed to bring back to my community? What are the concepts? What are the phases? How can I help people um, under, you know, become more, to create a healthy, creative, meaningful, savvy relationship with money? Mm. Because I'll just say one more thing and then I'll explain what it is, is that I really thought in that epiphany moment, I was the only one who had money issues or I was the only one who did not receive a financial education um, from grade school and up. And pretty quickly, I realized it's people from all different lineage, ethnicity, economic background. Most of us did not receive a financial education and an emotional literacy education. And so mm -hmm. in 2001, when it was time for me to integrate my past training as a psychotherapist with all these, the bookkeeping and money management, you know, uh, systems, Step one for me was helping people understand what are the money emotions that come up. So is it shame, anger, sadness, grief, anxiety, fear, guilt, hope, excitement, you know, and not only just what are they, but tools to 
um, name them, sit with them, learn how to be with them. So it's not so overwhelming or right. we don't ignore them. And so step one for me was a body check-in. That was the very first part of my methodology was step one, what do you do? Um, is learn how to check in with your body and understand what the money emotions are that are coming up and give you a little practice that you could do every day, not one and done, right? The body check-in is something you do every day during all the daily money interactions or conversations. So that was step one, but the methodology that I created has three phases and it integrates money healing, money practices and money maps. Hey Typology Tribe, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for helping us bring you what I hope is great content every week. Now, you all know I'm a big proponent of counseling, so whether you feel like something is interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving certain goals, counseling is a great tool to help identify what those blocks are and then work through them. Yet, you and I know finding a therapist can sometimes feel intimidating, but not with BetterHelp. BetterHelp offers online counseling at your own time and your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus text and chat with your therapist when it's convenient for you. These are licensed professional counselors who specialize in things like depression, anxiety, stress, relationships, LGBT matters, trauma, and grief. BetterHelp has counselors available worldwide and have over 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists across all 50 states. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. And get this, if you're not satisfied with your counselor for any reason, you can request a new one at any time at no additional cost. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. I want you to start living a happier life today. So as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash typology podcast. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Typology Podcast, T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y P-O-D-C-A-S-T. I think this is really fantastic because you know, we t the, the word money probably crosses our lips at least five times a day, right? We don't get much of an education about money growing up. Uh, and as you said, um, what's interesting to me is we don't have any classes on personality when we're little people. Like, oh, there are, there are different types of people. Yeah. You know, uh, and, given, and given the fact that m most of our conflicts in life uh, are around personality misunderstandings or conflict, that seems weird to me, right? It seems obviously obvious that we, we should have some conversations with little people about it. Anyway, um, one of the things, one of the questions someone once asked me that stopped me in my tracks, um, given that we talk about money, we obsess about it, we think about it, we feel about it, et cetera, was someone just said to me one day, Ian, um, addressing me specifically, what do you think money is for? And I remember going, what? I mean, you know, it's one of those questions that was like, you know, like, yeah, what's the purpose of money? Mm -hmm. And I, I thought to myself, that's very strange given how much we think about money, I have no idea how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Like, what's it for? You know? So can you in brief just say, like, from your perspective now, and again, looking through the lens of the Enneagram and a four, like, what's money for? So for me, you know, money is a really significant area of life. Um, I call it a garden. So it's one of those big areas that needs our attention and time and care. Really, it, it just is one of the big doorways 
that I go through with people to help them understand what's important to them, what's meaningful to them, how do they know their value and their worth. It's one of those places that, as we said, it's it's not taught. And I love how you said, I said financial literacy and emotional literacy wasn't taught. And you said, and also our personalities. Like that's a third right. thing. That's our, their life skills that are essential. And so for me, money is a life skill that needs to be understood on a very practical level and a very emotional and psychological yeah. level. Yeah. So I want to, you know, because our show is so Enneagram centric, I want to talk about personality types and money. So maybe we can talk about types and, and their relationship with money. Would that be a fun thing to do? Sure. We can try it. We can try it. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, we can try it. Sure. Well, what was your hesitation? No, no, no. Because I mean, I know the Enneagram well and have been dabbling in it for years, but let's, let's see, let's see what we can come up with. All right. Well, you know, add, subtract. We can, we can sort of see how it goes, right? Um, so let's talk first about the improvers. So they used to be called the perfectionists, but I now call them. I call them the improvers. I think it's a uh, a, a better way of speaking about their superpower. Really, you know. Um, I would say that in terms of habits, right? Um, this is a strength. I think that by nature, most improvers are pretty financially responsible. Like I've rarely met uh, uh, an improver that had a lot of debt or that didn't pay their bills on time or weren't very, weren't very responsible thinking about how do I live appropriately and in a conscientious and self-disciplined relationship with money, yeah. which is a good thing, right? Um, so they were good monitors of what stuff was. They were great mentors to others who wanted to do the same. The downside was, or, or the challenges was, were that they could become miserly if they weren't careful, like frugality could take over and they could be hyper scrupulous around money. Mm -hmm. um, and they needed a line item for fun. Right, right, which you know, I which is something that I suggest a lot for all different Enneagram types, but probably especially we're talking about number one, right? We're talking. Yes. Right. The perfectionist. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, I love that. Um, again, the strength and challenge that each type has. And I know, I know I'm speaking in big, broad generalities, you know, but eh, you know, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it, it is. When we can talk in generalizations, right, for each of these types, right? And then again, each person has to really dive in. I do think with ones that, for the most part, now, if someone veers off, you know, I don't want someone to feel bad, like, because money is a tough topic. And again, so many people have so much shame. Um, or they look around and they feel like everyone else learned about money, but I didn't. Or if I grew up in that family, if I had more money, I would have, right? So I don't want, I mean, but that's normal stuff. If you have any shame or have emotions coming up as we're talking about this, just do a little body check in, take some notes, get curious. You know, for me, the one, they're a bit more vigilant, right? They're a bit more hyper vigilant. And I think they would have a bookkeeping system in place or some tracking system in place that they would know well um, and be very upset with themselves if they weren't keeping track all the time and knowing what their numbers were and they might be looking too closely right they may need to back off a little bit um, they may need to add in a fun category or play category frivolous category unknown you know category right yeah absolutely and the last thing about being frugal, you would think like, what's the matter with that? I grew up with one parent who spent a lot and one parent, my mom, who was more frugal. Um, but then she had those places where she would spend. She's generous in gifts. Or when she would go visit my brother in Europe, she would pay for the nice seats because, you know, upgrade. And that's a lot of money, you know, to upgrade those. Yeah. Very frugal. She liked her Folgers coffee, right? <laughs> so, and my mom's probably has a one wing. She's a two with a one wing. So yeah. So but frugal, you can. I've known so many people that they found out their parents who would buy instant milk or wouldn't even sometimes pay for extra electricity, or they always were like, turn off the lights, turn off the lights. And when they passed, they learned that that parent had so much money, um, right. and they just never knew how to enjoy it. So yeah, you can be too frugal. You Yeah, it's interesting. There's an it's exchange interesting. thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that. Uh, in my experience, lots of people who you just described are fives. 
Interesting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, fives, fives tend to be minimalists and they, you know, we always laugh and say that fives typically don't win beauty contests. You know what I mean? Because they're just happy to wear 10 year old pants. You know, they don't, it's like, they're, they're all about conserving energy and wanting to be independent and self-sufficient and self-contained. So for them, it's not about, you know, they're, we, talk, we say their passion is avarice, but it's not greed in the traditional sense of the word. It has to do with retentiveness. They want to retain what little they think they have, mm. right? So you hear a lot about these um, fives who live in sort of squalid conditions and then they die and leave $5 million to build a library at their alma mater. Interesting. Um, uh, so there is that kind of um, five quality to the person you were like they they researched when they're going to buy something they research it to death you know um they'll collect coupons they'll reward cards of uh, airline miles they're they're you know they're just always checking these things out you know uh and again um they do they'll spend money on these sort of niche areas that they have interest in like i bet if your husband's really into biking he spent a lot of money on that bike well, see, that's the thing. You're describing my husband, but you're not. And so I think it depends so much on the wings, right? Because when I yes. met my husband 20 years ago, he had just come out of living in a teepee up high altitude in the mountains um, with hardly any possessions and had basically decided to live off the grid, you know? So right. that's where I found him. And that's that a five, man. <laughs> that is so fun. <laughs> but I brought him into culture and society, as he says, and it took him a while to find his own work and his own livelihood. And that was always his question, like, what's the purpose of life? Um, but my God, does he know how to spend money on his dreams? So yeah, he spends, he would love to spend, he would, if he could, he would have multiple bikes, which he doesn't. Or, you know, he has a lot of dreams that he's had since he was a kid, which I think are very four related. He wanted- I was gonna say, he sounds like he has a four wing. He wanted an electric car since he was a, you know, a kid and um, he has an electric car. That was a big gift he gave to himself last year. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, that that four wing, you know, um, can create a lot of what you're you're describing. The, the five or the six wing would have more anxiety right. than the five with the four. The aesthetics would really matter um, to him around the bikes and they're being beautiful and, you know, and all of that sort of side of things. Um, so let's talk about fours for a second because okay. we're both fours and I can, I can talk a little bit about my own re relationship with money. I had a lot of, uh, I grew up in a home where we had a tremendous amount of money followed by absolutely no money. Y you know what I mean? Like my father went from being a tremendously successful film producer and executive to someone who drank us into a hole. Right. Um, and for me, as a, as a four, I bring that history, right? So that's a piece of it. But, you know, being special, unique, and original doesn't come cheap. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, generally speaking, unless you want to go cheap on the consignments, you know, if you want to be special on the consignment shop side, which was never my thing, it was like, no... I don't want to print. I want the original pencil signed, you know, or um, I don't want a $500 Takamine to get guitar. I want a $4,000 Collings, you know, it's like I, it, to have beautiful things cost a lot of money. And I, I could be at the same time, even though I would spend a great deal of money on certain things that I loved, uh, I'd also have anxiety about it. And I had some shame because I'm a four shame comes naturally to me, you know, um, about how I would be around, uh, money. And when I got under stress and went to the hot, the low side of one, I would become very like panicked and anxious and organized. And I'll tell you, and what saved my life was getting a business manager who absolutely takes care of all of our per personal and professional, you know, stuff, right? Not everyone can do that, but that's basically what saved our lives. 
Hey folks, one more thing. I'd like to tell you about another podcast I know you're gonna love. It's called Tokens. It's a show that talks about difficult topics from a theological, ethical, and artistic perspective in a public setting. From live show content to one-on-one -on -one interviews with poets and authors, theologians and activists, scientists and educators, musicians and writers, and yes, even politicians, Tokens bravely goes into each topic with grace and hospitality. With each conversation, there's sure to be a piece of music or poem or even a comedy sketch that relates to the topic, breaking down barriers with things that unite us. It's hosted by my really good friend, Lee C. Camp, host and creator of The Tokens Show, which has been called Nashville's best variety show by the Nashville scene. You can listen to Tokens wherever you find your podcasts. So take a quick moment right now to go tap the subscribe button. Don't worry, I'll wait. What's your, how about you as a four? Like your relationship with my... Very different than you. So, and I think this goes back to what we're already talking about. In my family, I grew up middle class, uh, but I grew up with entrepreneurs. So my family was in real estate a bit. They also owned some of the first gay bars in Chicago with my uncles who were gay. And so, so there was that. There was also, my father was very intense. He was a very intense businessman. And so there was a lot of verbal sparring for me with him and I had to individuate against him, right? My mother was very frugal. So my dad was more the spender, but more on techie electronics and stuff or travel. My mother, her clothes were like as simple as you could get, like simple cotton clothes. So I love consignment store clothes. I love them. That's kind of changed over the years, but especially now I'm not going into consignment store clothes. I'm just, you know, buying stuff online or I stopped um, for many months. Um, so there's that. I, what do I want to say? For me, I had to, I was very confused about work and career and how I was going to create something that I loved and that was eventually lucrative. I, you know, with a master's degree in psychology at first working in the mental health field, I was making $11 an hour. Right, yeah. You know, I remember that so well and I didn't see any options out there, but I wanted body work. I, you know, I wanted some self care. I wanted really good chocolate to bring to, uh, you know, potluck dinners. I wanted to show up with a basket of chocolate. And so those led me into how am I going to make more money, but it can't be like my father. Um, it has to be in integrity. It has to be deeply in aligned um, with authentic, authentic. It has to be <laughs> incredibly creative, you know? And so yes. for someone who said, I just, I, I remember getting past six figures and that was exciting, but it was never like, I have to have a million dollar business. I always mapped everything out and I fell in love with those numbers. So I did my own bookkeeping for 10 years plus. And it was such a ritual for me. I create, I made it a ritual. I made it the sac sacred practice. And to know where I was clearly, instead of pretending, guessing, yep. doing this whole dance was incredibly empowering for me, you know? Yeah, I think um, that maybe one of the things for me as a four, and this may be, I think, again, these are generalities. Uh, when we talk about personality, we're talking about probabilities, not predictions, right? So it's probable that some fours or many fours find that they're they make emotional decisions about their, they need to sort of suspend emotions not suspend they need to sort of um, balance their emotional relationship with money with critical thinking totally you, you know so kind of like going uh, I just got to bring these into balance because I can't just keep spending based on my feelings you know? Well, and so I, I really feel like we have to first have the space and time to explore what those emotions are and how deep they run and feel them and deal with them. And that's, you know, I'm so, I say Naropa, my graduate school program saved me. It's what got me through my 20s, you know, to step into the rest of my life in a healthy way for myself and for others and to be a parent. Right. 
you know, I became a parent right before my 40th birthday. So we need that space first. And then we can go into like, what are the practical tools? What are the questions? And also not take ourselves so seriously all the time. And yeah, I still check in with my body. What's the emotion? But then I also ask, do I have the cash flow for this? Is this sure. is my values? What are my larger goals here? And so I never leave out the emotions, but back in the day, it was like the emotions ran the show and you know, they ran and led everything until us as fours have to really learn. Yes, they're so important, significant and meaningful. Um, but in some moments we just can't take them that seriously and we have to balance it out with other, other persons. Yeah. Well, let's go to another, um, we're, we probably won't be able to get through all nine types, but we can talk about some type from each of the, the centers, right? So we've, we've spoken about ones who are in the body sort of anger uh, triad. We've spoken about a little bit about your mom who's a two, fours are in the heart triad. We've mentioned your husband, the five, a little bit, but it might be fun just to talk for a minute about sevens, the enthusiasts. Yeah, but let's uh... just... Can we go to twos just for one second? And yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, twos have a really hard time with overgiving. That's, you know, overgiving is a big deal. Really, really watch that, like overgiving and then expecting others to do the same or be compensated in some way. And they can get really upset with that. And so, yes, they're generous, but they can be generous to a fault, just like you can be frugal to a fault. Right. I, I have. To, yeah, totally. I actually have a story about that. I know a woman who uh, she was a, rest- a retired school teacher and a two with a two wing, you know, and she. Wait, a two um, with a two wing? Wait, wait. Well, w- w- that's a joke. It just means that she was so two, she didn't even have a wing. <laughs> got you know? it, got it. I was like, wait. So, so uh, she, um, her daughter came to her one day and just in a conversation happened to say, oh, you know, my husband, you know, you know we bought a house that was too expensive and we're, we're going underwater and, Oh, it's sad, but we have to sell it and get something smaller and get a you know, get a mortgage that's a little bit you know more aligned with what we actually make for a living, you know. And I, you know, I think you know, gee, if mom had been sort of self-aware, uh, she just said, "Boy, that sounds like uh, it's a real drag." I'm sorry to hear it, but it sounds like a responsible thing to do, you know, like to get out of this anxious, terrible space where you can't, you know, every month is like come the 29th, you're, uh, you're a mess, right? But instead, mom, the not very self-aware too, shows up at their door one day with a $250,000 check. She had raided her 401k to get a $250,000 check. And she shows up like so excited on the front door, like, I'm, and she had a plan. Oh, she had a plan. The plan was you can pay me back without interest this much a month over the next, I don't know, 140 years, you know? And the daughter had been through a lot of therapy and Mm. knew the Enneagram and knew mom. So she was smart enough to go, this smells bad. (laughs) Which is a good response. I don't know how mom reacted, but. um... Yeah. Yeah, well, mom, she didn't say it to mom, but she did decline, you know, because she knew she not accept that gift. Yeah. Yeah, because she knew that mom in return unconsciously wanted love, love, appreciation, attention, approval. And this thing had a lot of strings attached. Yep. You know, Um, what do you think about threes? Because people with threes and money, the achievers. You know, people have some misconceptions about threes and money, too, not just uh, there's sort of a stereotype about threes with money, isn't there? Is that they're just extremely successful and, you know, yeah, I, I think the stereotype is they all want to be the CEO of Goldman Sachs. And I, and I think that's absolutely wrong. I think it's context based. So if you grew up in a family in the mafia, if you were a three, you would want to be the Don or, you you know, so it's not necessarily but they do like outward expressions or signals that they're successful which is why sometimes people always think oh they want to get rich so they can buy a ferrari and a big house and blah 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 but and because they're so afraid of failure right they're chasing money seems to be the most obvious signal of success but there are other ways of expressing it too in different milieus that said what do you think about three relationships with money in your experience? Well, there's a few different layers of here. There's what do we do with our work, um, our, our relationship to achievement, ambition, success. 
Um, and then how do we spend money or, you know, money's like one little piece in that whole puzzle. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the, the threes that I've worked with, they, they have big ambition for themselves and in different life phases, they mean, may need to really uh, take a check and slow down. And that's incredibly hard for them. Um, but sometimes that's what I have to work with them about. A lot of threes do know how to make a lot of money. Um, they don't always plan it well, though. They don't always like invest it or save it. Or I've had some threes where they still were in debt. Um, even yes. though they're making tons of money, they just weren't looking. They weren't looking. Yeah. But I, I see that anyway. So that's sevens also are terrified to look at and have bookkeeping systems and luck. So we'll talk about them. Yeah. But those threes, you know, that three thing is really important because I actually worked with, a, I, I lived in Greenwich, Connecticut. I grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut and didn't leave there. I've worked there for many years. So I was working with a hedge fund manager who was living in the wealthiest neighborhood in Greenwich, which is saying something, overlooking Long Island Sound with a view of the skyline of Manhattan. He was 35 years old. And we went for a walk one day and he said, I'm terrified. And I said, well, why? And he said, because we are living paycheck to paycheck. I, I, he, he says, I have three kids in these, in, two in boarding school, one in a private day school. My mortgage is like $18,000 a month. My, you know, he just, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you make multiple seven figures and you are living month to month, you know, multiple country clubs, multiple car leases, you know, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I, it never occurred to me that, that that might be the case. So you're right. They can be very irresponsible and out of control with money. Well, just so image focus and, and outward success focus that it's hard for them to really slow down and get mm -hmm. deep inside and say, really, what do they want and right. what's important to them? And what are they willing to give up now so they can have this other thing, but also so that they can, you know, get themselves through a transition or do things different or you know, so, or slow down and, um, yeah, but they're incredible achievers and they're yeah. successful and they, you know, and you know, I have a Capricorn in me, so I love going after a goal. Um, I'm slower about it, more slower and steady. I don't like fast pace, quantum leap and threes like quantum leaping fast, fast leaping. They really love that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that question, that we opened with uh, is a good question for fours because the self-reflection for three, sevens and eights doesn't come naturally. For you and I, it comes too naturally at one level. It's like we can become so introspective and self-reflective that it, we just get lost in a morass, you know, of, you know, our imaginations running wild in a million different directions. Uh, but, but the question for a three to ask them to sort of frame out a philosophy of money where there it's like, okay, let's move beyond accumulation and just start to talk about what is your philosophy around money? You know what I mean? In other words, can you articulate an, uh, a, um, uh, the, an answer to the question of what's money for, you know, going back to that so that they can really begin to, think rather than accumulate and spend for unconscious reasons that are unhealthy. So let me tell a short story about that. I don't know if Janine Roth, the food expert who then wrote a, wrote a book called Lost and Found. Do you know her story? No. More of a one, but she might be a three because she's, she's pretty strong in her marketing and ambition and where she's taken her work over the years. But her motivating goal was security. And so she saved like crazy millions of dollars. You know, that was her number one goal from her childhood, right? Her, something about her father. Again, I don't know what her personality type is, if it's a one or a three. Um, and she got a phone call one day that, you know, um, all her money with Bernie Madoff was oh, gone. Boy. Or most of their money was gone in one fell swoop, in one moment. And so, you know, her goal was security. And so in that, she had to completely reevaluate what true security 
and safety really means to her and is it a dollar amount and is it a retirement amount um and she wrote a whole book lost and found and had to find you know she had to uh reevaluate all of that and and come up with a different way to find safety and security that wasn't about the numbers and then she did go back to um investing she's a really good investor so um, and saver. She's a really good saver. So maybe she, who she could be a six, you know, and just, she could be a six. She could be a six. Right. And she just yep. really needs that. And that's um, a security blanket for her. But because she lost so much, she had to reevaluate and ask all these new questions and find how to access safety and security in different ways. Right. Realize it's yeah. Yeah. So she could also be what's called a self-preservation three. Uh, so the self-preservation three uh, tends to um, acquire possessions, money, saving for purposes of security, not for purposes of recognition and status. Right. Right. Um, so you know, again, these these this is why I'm always telling people it's so important to uh, my listeners that that learning subtypes is important because self-preservation threes often get confused with sixes. Okay. And and so there's actually a three. Most people's idea of a three is what's called a social three, and they're kind of the quint. They're the th they're the threes to the threes. You know what I mean? It's like that's what everyone thinks of when they think of threes. But but there's two other types of threes, and and one being the self pres three, which is much more concerned around security and accumulation. Hey everybody, one of the lessons I've learned over the years is that not everybody benefits from a traditional 50 minute counseling session. And this is why some people can go to couples therapy or personal counseling for a long time and never really get anywhere. This is why I'm such a believer of intensive counseling and my friends at Restoring the Soul in Colorado, created by my longtime friend, Michael Cusick, to help couples or individuals experience deep change and happiness day blocks over one or two weeks. Now listen, if you can't wait months or years to get to the bottom of an issue or to experience breakthrough, you need to get in touch with my friend Michael and his extraordinary team of counselors at Restoring the Soul. If you're looking to get out of the rut you're in but can't wait months or years, call Restoring the Soul today for a free consultation with Michael's staff. Call 303-932-9777 and learn how their intensive counseling process can help you. As a special bonus, just for Typology listeners, make sure to visit www.restoringthesoul.com slash typology to download their PDF called Five Ways Unaddressed Trauma May Be Derailing Your Relationships. We can't leave sixes out, can we? Let's talk about sixes. We'll, how about we'll just do a fast run. How's that? Sounds good. Okay, six. Talk about sixes, the loyalists. What do you think? Because their thing is all about safety and security. Yeah, and anxiety and managing their anxieties. Um, I, I've seen both very frugal sixes, um, but I've also seen anxiety spending as well and just plowing right. through inheritance because they don't really think that there's a future. Um, mm -hmm. so I've seen that. Um, yeah, I, I had a, I was I, I was with a six before my husband. That was over twenty years ago, and I've kind of blocked that out. I've blocked it out. So I don't know. You tell me. What do you What do you think are positive? Well, yeah. So I think, you know, like improvers, they're they're risk averse, right? Um, so they'd probably be traditional investors, mutual funds. They're probably not going to mess around with stocks. You know what I mean? Like they're not going to be unless you know, unless what like hack. And so they research investing investment options, just like they right. research when to buy. So you said that was a five thing, but the six I was with did that like crazy. And maybe he had a so maybe a very strong five wing, you know, or it was driven by security needs, right? Like I need to know everything. So it could be a whole different motivation. Um, I think their their mantra sometimes is failing to prepare is preparing to fail. So it's like there's always an emergency fund. You know, or usually there's an emergency fund uh, and they're chronic worriers. Right. So this is the downside. Right. On the upside, when they're really healthy, I think they're they actually hold money with the proper. They don't have an arthritic 
grip on it, nor do they just cast caution to the wind. You know, there's there's two subtypes uh, that are worth mentioning in sixes. One is you have a phobic subtype, which would be they're very in touch with their fear. And so they know they're fearful. But there's this counterphobic six, which is the counter type who doesn't know they're afraid and might be um, fearless. If they were afraid of money, they would act fearless around it, not fearful. They would rather rebel than submit versus the phobic who would rather submit than rebel. So they would be much more probably uh, defiant around money than the phobic six. So I think my financial planner is a six and he plans everything out meticulously. And they live in California, so there's, they've had to evacuate last year, they almost had to this year. You know, bags are packed, everything's in place. He's also able to, you know, he's a great investor. He's, he's able to think about every single possible scenario, good and bad, and has it all planned out. He's a great financial planner and he's a great thinker. Um, he was really into permaculture for years. And, and has taken like every single first aid um, emergency class and had his child and wife doing it too. And they, you know, there's, so it's, yeah. a, it's the positive is that, you know, yeah. they, and then he meditates. So we add that in and there's a lot of resiliency. And so, you know, everything's planned out every single option. I'm like, are you freaking out? And he's like, well, I already have weighed every single option. <laughs> and he's considered everything. So, yeah. I think that's really wise. I mean, I, I think every type, if they were a financial planner, would bring different gifts to the table, you know, um, if they were healthy. And I think with those sixes that, um, you know, like in companies I've worked with where the CFO – or the risk management team was run by a six, that's a really good thing. Like, I'm always like, tell me about your risk management system here and who's running it. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and so it's not that another type couldn't be a good risk manager. I'm just saying it's a natural for a six. You know, it's like a, it's a natural gig for a six. All right, sevens. Okay. Sevens and money. What do you think? Enthusiasts. Well, the guy that I interviewed, the Enneagram expert for years, he was a seven. So he talked about a few things. One is that he was an incredible manifester. Um, and that, that was his language. So he was always talking about what he can manifest. And of course, he always had tons of ideas. Um, too many ideas. That's the downfall. But the plus size is multi-passionate entrepreneur. Um, lots of ideas. Um, and he was terrified of his numbers and bookkeeping. Um, and there was a time where he really wasn't willing to look at anything, you know, his numbers at all. So it was, you know, like on a couch somewhere for a period of time, you know, in a depression, um, didn't know how to handle all of his sevenness energy. Um, but he put it out there again and he's an Enneagram expert and coach. And when he started getting really clear about, um, different ways to bring his work to the world and got a team to support him, um, probably the online business man, the business manager, and to help corral um, and and create marketing around it, and just a few courses instead of ten, you know. Mm. And he's right. he, that's something he's constantly struggling with, but he's a bright light. Um, and yeah, when he gets excited about something, and th there's always just a lot of action. And I oh yeah going on yeah yeah i think i think the thing about sevens and money when i'm thinking about it is um they could be impulsive yes they're impulse buyers uh they can you know i'm always telling you know how when they throw the, like they take up snowboarding and instead of saying i'm gonna rent a snowboard this year and just see how i like it they go buy three they'll buy the whole thing they'll, they'll, the exactly the boots, the clothes, I mean, everything comes, right? And and then a month later, they're like, oh, I didn't really like snowboarding. And so it's in the garage, you know? Um, I, I think, you know, at their best, they're able to, if, they're, if they have, if they've evolved, they're, they're able to delay gratification much better. I think they um, can, because they're connected to one on, on you know, uh, on the Enneagram, even though it's where they go in stress, it can also, if they can choose to go to the high side of one, 
if they want and and learn how to budget wisely and be mm. conscientious about watching the numbers every month making sure that without being neurotic about it but just being you know reasonably responsible um but i think man impulse i have a seven son oh my lord and they like really nice things yeah that's it's not true. like yeah they they like high-end luxury things oh yeah the three to yeah. some but so th that's the hardest thing for them is that they want it all and it's really hard for them to choose because they're all in accordance with their values on some level they right. just have so many wants and desires. So that's a long journey and road to get to the healthier end of like having to pick what are they gonna yep. let go of, what are they gonna keep just for this phase. Every six months they could reevaluate all of that, but they want it all. They do. Yeah. The other thing I've noticed about sevens and money is, or just in general, but this applies to money is when they're not when they're young or really older and lacking a lot of self awareness is um, that they're, they're grandiose. So there's this kind of um, grandiosity around money and I'll, oh, I can get that because I'm gonna make a lot of money. And you're like, well, how? And it's like, they're in their imagination thinking about a future of unlimited possibilities. And it's like, no, no, right now, how are you going to do that? <laughs> you know? And they're like, I'll do it, you know? It's a bit manic energy and it is grandiose and they do, they like to take big leaps too instead of like, what's the next incremental step? It's almost painful for them to do that. Um, yeah. And yeah, they do think that they could create and manifest anything and everything. But you know, they, they, some of them can, it just takes more step, many more steps to get there. And that might sure. be a whole thing, but that's good. Yeah. All right, let's talk about those eight challengers. What do you think about eight challengers and money? <laughs> Well, they, they, um, they're really into power and control and they, there's a right way to do things in a, in a wrong way. Um, I'm talking about the negatives. I, my father was an eight. So our biggest dynamic that was challenging for me was that he used money as power and control over. Um, and so there was a lot of things I had to do, but then there wasn't clear communication about what the strings were that were attached, what the conditions were, what the agreements were. It was just use, and that's unhealthy, right? So that's the unhealthy version is using right. money um, in a power over way to control. Um, healthy version i mean we're i'm not so much saying about money right now because again i'm waiting for the expert to write this book who's going to write this right. book? i don't know maybe me I, maybe i've just written it on this on this program <laughs> i'm not um I've, i'm writing a second book so already so um let's see i mean i, I was going to go into like they're leaders they're good at creating things they're good at running the show but i'm not talking so much about money so t you tell me like i mean eights have a way though I, there are a lot of money teachers and money gurus that are eights yes and they're very clear this is how you invest don't ever have debt ever but some of those eights you know they had debt and they got into their own challenging very real life right. situation because of the housing market and had to file bankruptcy and then they've moved into now no debt ever which you know, I don't make Blake in statements like that as a four. I'm like, no, it depends on the time of life you're in, the phase, how you're using it. Do you have a plan? You know, right. so you tell me what, what are some positives around eights around money? Well, I think I know two kinds of at least two kinds of eights. These are members of my family. Um, one is they don't like eights don't want to be controlled by other people. So they are much more concerned. They are less concerned about controlling you than they are about you trying to control them. So, so I have a, a, an eight I know, and she, the number one thing that she wanted when she left college was to have no debt. And it wasn't because it was responsible. She just didn't want a bank to own her or control her or to be at the mercy of some institution. Um, so it was a much, it, it was a lot more eight themed, you know, but eights, eights can be impulsive too. Um, and they can, you know, lust is their passion, you know, which is about excess and needing immediate stimulation. So I've also seen eights make 
big decisions about money without a lot of thought and that didn't end well, you know? So yeah. there's, I think there's sort of a, there's a continuum for every type, but that's on that eight type, you know? Hey, when they're healthy, they, they realize that moderation uh, or however we want to put it, isn't a restraining order. You know, it's like y you can have a healthy relationship with money. And this that's true for sevens, too, who hate limitations, right? Or imposed limitations. It's like, hey, man, you know, this is not a restraining order. This is just about living. And I think you'll understand when I say this mindfully. Just live mindfully in your relationship with money. And I think a lot of times every type, if it's not you know, and I encourage all of my listeners and students to have a mindfulness practice so that they can self-observe, you know, what is happening right now um, in my life, in my type, and why am I acting, thinking, and feeling this way in this moment, you know? Um, so eights, that's not a natural thing for them, you know? Like med there are certain types for whom meditation is really painful. Eights can be one of them. Um, and, uh, but again, when they're healthy, they're very self-reliant and they practice moderation and they're content. They're not, they don't have this kind of Zorba the Greek gusto pouring out in every direction. They just have sort of a content sort of vibe about them, you know, which is really healthy. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, fours, particularly one kind of four, uh, can be, there's actually, a, you know, there's a type of four, the sexual four is... Um, I'm right here that I'm like, that. I'm that. <laughs> That's right. Everyone wants to be their sexual variety. Oh, no, whether I'm one. <laughs> you know, it's one to one. Okay, we'll call it one to one. So that, but the one to one type is more aggressive than an eight. It, it, people think eights are the most aggressive number in the Enneagram. I can just tell you, a one to one four is very, very powerful um, and very intense. And I'm not, not to say that that's what your subtype is, but to let people know that, you know, fours aren't always wandering around the woods, you know, saying, consider the lilies. You know, it's like, you know, they have a lot of energy and intensity, you know, whether it's in relationships or with money or whatever, they're intense about pretty much everything. Um, so I can see where that was a dynamic uh, in, a, in a family growing up. Let's jump to nines, though, because we only have so much time. Um, peacemakers. I'm married to one. I got a, I'm father to one. What do you think? How do you think peacemakers relate to money? Um. One of my teaching assistants, a somatic experiencing therapist, um, and one of my teaching assistants for years was a nine, is a nine. She always talked a lot about checking out and mm -hmm. um, like just checking out of her body, checking out and not paying attention and going to Netflix and going to these habits that were really unhealthy right. for for her, I am fine with Netflix and all of that in, you know, in moderation. Um, right. One of the things that you would always talk about, I don't know how it was related to money for her, though. Um, but that right. her patterns that she was always, always working with, like this tendency. And also to, you know, like where we didn't know where she was. Like, where are you? You know, where are you in the room? Um, like, please speak up. I want to hear from you. I want to hear your take. Um, 
stand up more in your own sense of self and your own right and so I, I don't you tell me how yeah well you you just expressed a lot of what fours would struggle with with nines it would, mm. would be the lack of intensity and the fact that nines when they're not self-aware tend to merge with big personalities like fours and the four and the four eventually would be, would be like you are khaki you are too bland. I need more intensity. I need more authenticity from you. I don't need you to be a, a facsimile of me. I need you to be your own person, be authentic, claim your ground, uh, be present here 100% when you're here. Um, what, don't be passive aggressive with me because a lot of times that's where nines go uh, with their anger. You mentioned something that is the it is the defense mechanism of nines, which is called narcotization. So they'll eat, they'll get on the couch, watch, they'll binge, you know, they'll watch Breaking all of Breaking Bad, you know, in you know, three days they won't get off the couch, you know. Uh, they'll um, be, uh, but they can also do it with exercise, you know, or they can do it, which doesn't sound intuitive, but that's anything to get away from their desires and their anger and to maintain inner peace. And if that involves smoking a lot of pot or eating a sleeve of donuts or, you know what I mean? Like just checking out is a big piece of their life, you know? So around money, do they have spending moments to check out and then yeah. their famine experience? Do, do they do that with how they yeah. money or well, what are the patterns? Well, unfortunately, here's the downside. They can be very disorganized. They're distractible. Bills will pile up. They're great at denial. Um, money tends to leak different places. Uh, so I'm always saying like, like nines, please use auto pay on everything. You know, I'm always like, make sure that you have uh, a system or a person in place that's watching or helping you watch your finances because they just kind of don't want anything to enter their lives that would cause emotional, psychological or somatic distress. They want everything to be calm, you know, and if the money thing isn't going to make them calm, they'll just go eat a sleeve of donuts or they'll watch Netflix or they'll just, just as you said, check out. Uh, we've got to wrap up, even though I go forever on this conversation. I'm talking to Barry Tesler, the author of The Art of Money, um, who integrates money healing, money practices, and money maps on her year-long money school. She has the podcast, The Art of Money podcast, and her website, barrytesler.com, B-A-R-I-T-E-S-S-L-E-R.com. And she's at Barry Tesler. Uh, uh, her handle is that, oh, I guess, across all of your socials. And this has been a fascinating conversation. It has. We could have kept going, though. There's a, there's a lot more in all. Oh, my gosh. Two fours? Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's have you back on. This may be a two-part episode, but but let's let's have you back on and let's maybe dig even a little deeper the next time. This was a wonderful sort of 50,000 foot pass on types and money. And, uh, and thank you for your work. You're welcome. Thanks so much for having me. And to all of our listeners, remember the great words of the wonderful Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Until next time. <laughs>